Hi, I'm Ashley Wessel and welcome to Prime. Baby, it's cold outside, so today we're going to warm you up with some food, fire, and flaming Diablos. Our first guest is Dane Cummins, Director of Dining Services at Edgemere Senior Living Community here in Dallas. Hi, Dane. How are you? Good to see you, Ashley. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Now, Dane, I know that you've been in the hospitality industry for quite some time. So tell me, where did your love of food come from? Well, uh, I got into the hospitality industry about 30 years ago. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. And uh, I guess I had a passion, always had a passion for food and uh, a great party. Um, it started with uh, my first catering on the set of Hollywood Squares back when Paul Wynn and, uh, and Vincent Price was, was, were still on. Very nice, very nice. So, born and raised in Los Angeles, and then you made your way to Texas. Moved, moved to Texas in 1980. Now, was that a big adjustment for you? A major adjustment. Yes, yes, wonderful. Now, what brought you to Texas? Rest of the family. Rest of the family. I'm the oldest of eight, so this is where I ended up with everyone else. I was last. Okay. Now, you started in the, ho or the hotel and restaurant industry, and now you're in senior living. I've been in senior living about 20 years now, oh. and... Uh, and uh, never looked back once I joined up. And have you seen, what are some of the big differences between the two industries? Uh, I, I would say uh, probably I have a captive audience on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, I opened Edgemere 10 years ago mm -hmm. and here in Dallas in the Park Cities area. And uh, so I have 600 uh, captive uh, individuals to please on a day-to-day -day basis. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, Edgemere just celebrated their 10-year anniversary. Yes. And how have you seen uh, people's views on food change over the years? Well, uh, dining services at Edgemere has been ever-evolving for the last 10 years. Uh, what we offered or did 10 years ago has uh, changed every year since based on residents' preference, likes, and dislikes. So uh, it's, it's been ever-changing. Wonderful, wonderful. Now today you've prepared a cold weather cocktail party. Yes. Which it looks amazing. Um, all the food looks delicious. So tell me a little bit about what goes into preparing for an event like this. For me personally, first and foremost is presentation. Um, if it doesn't look good, it's not worth putting on. Absolutely. And so uh, it's all about presentation with me and then uh, the variety uh, of uh, foods to enhance uh, enhance uh, your taste buds. Okay, so tell me about, so we're talking about decor, let's talk about the decor first. So I see a color pattern going on here, so how did you color. decide on the type of color scheme? Because I know that's important as well. Um, I, sometimes you, you don't always have to decide on a color theme, you just grab what you can find and put it all together, mix and match. It's very eclectic. It is, and it looks amazing. Now the fun stuff, the uh -huh. food. So tell me a little, about, a little bit about what you've prepared well, um, for us today. Well, a little sweet, a little hot, a little spicy. We have our cheese queso over here with pico de gallo and chorizo sausage. And that's this right here? Yes, that's that there. With, it's great with vegetables and crackers. Uh, we have uh, on the sweet side our flourless chocolate cake with cayenne pepper and fresh fruit. Uh, we have truffles. We have a fabulous hummus here mm -hmm. topped with a lemon oil and uh, orange zest. Orange zest. And uh, Now, that's, if that's I great. wanted to, you know, host a party like uh -huh. this and the, the items you've mentioned already, I could prepare this Absolutely. myself and it wouldn't be too difficult or messy? Not a problem. You have my phone number, pick up the phone and call me. I'll okay, tell you how good, to do it. Okay, good, good. Well, I know where to find you. <laughs> Absolutely. We also have a chocolate fondue with the fresh fruits and the marshmallows and all the toppings down here. Um, now, let's take a look at Absolutely. This. So you have, are these the fruits that you would recommend to go with? Yeah, with, with this I would. And then all the toppings uh, to accompany delicious. the fondue, you know, make a big difference. Uh, we have uh, orange peel and we have, uh, we have, uh, what are those nuts, Chef? Marcona almonds. Marcona almonds, Marcona almonds. that are crushed. Uh, crushed peppermint over here. Wonderful. Just all kinds of uh, variety. It looks, like I said, it all looks amazing. Now, how much prep time would you say takes for, to put on something like this? Uh, for us, not much time at well, all. Well, y'all are the experts, <laughs> so. But uh, it, it 
doesn't take much time at all. Uh, you're not going to go make those truffles yourself. Go to a nice store and pick them up. Uh, it's easy to melt some chocolate and paraffin and for your fondue. And mm -hmm. it's very easy to put this together. No, it looks, looks amazing. So tell us a little bit about some of the parties and events that you've catered. Um, I know that you've, you know, held and hosted some, some well-known people throughout the, the Metroplex. Um, what, like, what have you seen people like most? Is it the food? Is it, you know, the, the atmosphere? Is it the, the presentation? What do you think people it's, look for? It's the all most? of the above. Yes. It's all of the above. Um, it's got to look good, it's got to taste good, and it's got to be creative. Got to be creative. And so that's what we do. Okay. Okay, well now I know it wouldn't be a cocktail party without a signature drink. So tell us a little bit about what drink you've prepared for us today. Flaming Coffee Diablos, Ashley. And I we're love gonna the name. We're going to start, it's a Spanish drink orig originally. Uh, there are many uh, variations of a recipe for a Coffee Diablo. But we are going to uh, go with uh, somewhat of an Italian version, and we're going to go with uh, So this is the Italian the version of the Spanish coffee drink. Correct. <laughs> and I, I say that because I, I top it off with Frangelica and uh, little Grand Marnier. Okay. So what kind of equipment is this that we're... It's an, any kind of an open flame okay. to uh, warm your brandy. And uh, you need a good flame, unfortunately, because uh, you need to ignite this. So and this it takes will quite a while to do. So what, we're not going to wait for the flame. We're going to uh, go ahead and just prepare it warm. Okay. So if you were to do this the you know the real way, so to say, um, we would get you a, would flame have a flame going, and we would take it back and forth as many times as you want, and there would be a flame going from one, in, one glass to the next. Oh, wow. And you could do that as many times as you want, equal out your brandy. Now, while you're preparing that, I, yes. I also wanted to um, let everyone know we have Executive Chef Charles French from Edgemere. He um, also helped prepare everything that you see today, the food and everything. So I wanted to give him a special thank you as well. Thank, thank you, you Ashley. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Okay, so what did, what did we... That was the Grand Marnier, the brandy, the coffee. We have our Frangelica. And we're going to top it off. Now what is this around, around the glass? That is sugar coated. Now, how many times have you made have you made this drink? I have made this drink. I can't, I couldn't count the times I've made this drink. I've been making it for about 20 years. For about 20 years. And I've even had the flame running up my arm. It was so good. Well, that <laughs> looks amazing. Oh, and it it is warm. It is warm. Okay, this is gorgeous. And there's sugar around. Sugar around the make, top. Whipped cream. It's ready to drink. It is, and it's definitely warm. So tell me, Dane, um, so the parties that you prepare, because I know, especially when it's cold outside, people don't want to go out. You know, they don't want to go to a restaurant or, or anything. They want to mm -hmm. bring people in. Um, what's, what's an ideal size for an intimate cocktail party? What are you comfortable with? Well, 10, I guess it, 10, 20. 10, 20? Somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay, good. So something like this, how many people would this, serve a party like this? Well, if they're not coming for dinner, it uh, would serve, this would serve about 20 people. Serve about 20 people? Yeah. Well, that's, it's great. Now, Chef, would you, is there anything else that you would add to this menu? You know, it's cold outside. I know a lot of these have spicy foods um, to, you know, really warm the senses, warm, warm the body. Um, is there anything else, you know, that you would add or even that you could substitute? Like, let's say with the in this, this has cayenne, correct? Yeah, the flourless chocolate cake, you can make it without the, the, the cayenne. It's very simple to make. It's chocolate. We use Swiss chocolate. It's eggs and butter, some coffee, a cinnamon stick. And you just melt the, boil the coffee, pour it over the chocolate, whip it until it's smooth, whip in your butter on, in, a, in a mixer, and then you fold in your eggs, you bake it off. You go to the grocery store, it's a three-pound aluminum pan. It's just a straight-sided aluminum pan. 
uh, there's two of them or three of them in a pack at the grocery store. You fill it up just a little bit under the edge. You bake it uh, 300 degrees in mm -hmm. a water bath for 55 minutes. Very nice. And you chose to do flourless. Is that kind of more of a trend thing or is it just to... It's, it's probably number one dessert at Edgemere. Is it? We've made it for the last two years and when we make it, we make probably 60 cakes a week. Do you really? When we sell it. Uh, amazing. Big seller. Now events, I know that at Edgemere you have a lot of special events, mm -hmm. um, you know, going on every week. Um, so is stuff like this the kind of food items that you prepare? Or, you know, is it it's depending on the, the theme? Wants, uh, but we do exactly what we do here on the table. We make hummus, we make the, the queso with chorizo, uh, just whatever the customer wants. No, it's amazing. And now, Chef, have you, have you made this drink before as well? I have not, but I've made Bananas Foster as many times as he's made this drink. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about different types of drinks. Like I said, I know we're talking about a cocktail party. So this one, what other type of drink would you, would you recommend? Not, it doesn't necessarily have to be coffee. Um, what are other, you know, kind of more festive drinks that y'all would? The mojitos, the rum drinks. You can do it with the flaming rum, the 151 rum. You can make any kind of rum, any kind of drink you like. Mm -hmm. What about um, you know for those that maybe don't drink non-alcoholic drinks? What are what are some favorites for those to cater to to everyone? Smoothies. 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 Absolutely, and so I'm sure, and I'm sure smoothies can be made. You know, all different sorts of of fruits. Um, I'm, can you do vegetable smoothies? I mean, what? We can do any kind of smoothie. Or do you somebody do, would want. Do you do smoothies at Edgemere? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, okay. Well, I think I would love to, you know, take a little drink of this. You probably should. Probably should. <laughs> Will we get... That is good. That is good. Okay, well, for more information about Edgemere, please visit www.edgemeredallas.com or call 469-619-0825. Two, five. And when we come back, designer Dan Lee will be warming us up by the fireplace. Welcome back to Prime. I'm Bill Pemberton, and baby, it is cold outside. If you're having a hard time staying away from this winter chill, maybe you should consider creating a cozy and warm room inside your very own home, starting with a fireplace. Designer Dan Lee with Resort and Retirement Design is here today to share some ideas on how we can stay warm and do it with style. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Bill. It's fun to be back again. Well, Dan, we all love a good fireplace, but I think a lot of us don't know a lot about fireplaces, and maybe I'm the kind of guy that likes to start at the beginning. So could you give us a little history lesson on fireplaces? Oh, well, I think it's in our genes, isn't it? From our yes. prehistoric uh, relatives uh, building a fire in the cave to the time that they moved into building shelters. And actually, I don't know that a lot of people realize this, but <clears throat> originally there was a hole in the roof, much like a teepee. Right. And Fires were built in the middle of that space and that kept them warm. And so we, uh, we certainly have uh, a history of enjoying a fire and staying warm around a fire. It ultimately moved to the, uh, to the built house mm -hmm. and the chimney was put on the mm -hmm. exterior wall. And, uh, and then we, you know, basically used a fireplace to heat every room. Right. Uh, after our uh, pilgrims came over mm -hmm. to the United States. Uh, they they brought with them the traditions right. that they had had in right. uh, Europe, and uh, I want to show you uh, a number of uh, 
photographs today right. of projects that I think uh, kind of uh, explain what I'm saying here. This is a, uh, an image of a fireplace in a colonial house in New England. Uh, the fireplace, of course, right. is in the dining room. Hmm. And fireplaces were not only used to warm rooms, but right. they were used for cooking. And that has multiple purposes. And you can see right. it's a lovely fireplace that's even appropriate today because of the warm, rich woods and the utensils around it and just a great family gathering spot. Exactly. You can't think about the pilgrims or the colonial times without thinking about right. a hearth. And, of course, that was all about functionality and survival. Today, I guess a fireplace really isn't about survival anymore. It's about style. It's about comfort. And like everything else, style and comfort today, we've got a plethora of choices. Maybe you could talk us through a little bit some of the traditional styles that have, that have been favorites and tell us a little bit about them. Well, that's a, that's a great point. Actually, when the pilgrims came over, you know, most of mm -hmm. the pilgrims were English and French mm -hmm. and uh, Spaniards that first came. And so those styles have continued to be the strong styles that we see traditionally in our homes. <clears throat> this particular image is a French fireplace. And of course, it's built with limestone. Wow, it's beautiful. Very common to wow. uh, a French design room. It, it can either be a low mantle or mm -hmm. a high mantle all the way to the ceiling. Wow. And you can see that it works nicely with the mm -hmm. uh, beamed ceiling area. And it becomes the focal point of the room. I have multiple fireplaces in my home, and I find that they're a great focal point. Oh, absolutely. This looks like Versailles. Beautiful. It's great. And then this is a room that I designed uh, for a family that had an English Tudor home. Ooh. A little later yeah. period in the English style, but um, unlike the French style with the limestone, mm -hmm. the English uh, tended to use a lot of wood. And in later periods, of course, it was painted. But mm -hmm. the earlier periods, right. these were very carved, beautiful, mm -hmm. ornate fireplaces, wonderful mantles, oftentimes mm -hmm. built with images of... Um, uh, mm -hmm. their pets and their animals right. and, and oil paintings that were hung on the wall. And then we have uh, these built-in niches in this home, mm -hmm. which are a great display place for uh, dishes. Very beautiful. You do some beautiful work, Dan. Thank you. What else have you got there? <clears throat> well, of course, we're here in the Southwest. <laughs> right. And uh, everybody loves smelling pina wood. Absolutely. And uh, having just been in Santa Fe myself during Christmas, it was wow. a, a wonderful experience to be near Akiva. So. Mm. Kivas are great because they are part of our uh, southwestern heritage with the Indians in the Mexican culture. Uh, and they fit into a small room mm -hmm. uh, because they typically are in a corner. Right. And they're adobe and they're very practical to build. Interesting. And so, and so it's actually built into the structure of the house. And I guess all of these are essentially structural fireplaces. All of these that I've shown you are structural fireplaces. Mm -hmm. And I want to show you one that is a non-traditional fireplace. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is very architectural, mm -hmm. but as you can see, it would be very appropriate for a family that likes casual living. Right. Uh, perhaps uh, this would work at a, as a lake house or it right. would work well in um, a, a ski resort. Mm -hmm. And the thing I love about this particular image is if you look, the, the architectural style mm -hmm. has embraced the cathedral ceiling in the room and created the opening to the very fireplace nice. to be reminiscent of the shape of the roof. And so it's very well integrated, yeah. and this is a, a mixture of materials. Well, that's beautiful. Dan, so all of these are structural. In other words, they're built inside the actual architecture of the house. Do homeowners have an option? Are there other ways to enjoy the beauty of a fireplace without having to go into the whole structural type of approach? Absolutely. And many times, of course, when we want to renovate mm -hmm. or remodel our homes, we don't have the luxury of right. building it from ground up. Right. Um, I want to show you another image here that is of a fireplace insert. Mm -hmm. And this is a very practical, easy way to add a fireplace wow. to your home. And you can see this is a dramatic shot. This is Beautiful. A, a home that was planned around the fireplace, but it's an insert, which means that it's a metal box. Hmm. It's been built to sit on the <clears> foundation, <throat> but as you can see, the right. windows have exposed the flue that's on the exterior of the house. Very contemporary looking. Very smart yeah. looking, right. uh, very uh, fitting for the room and the height of right. the space. So this could actually be something retrofitted. Somebody could come uh, into their home and easily just build this right in. Easily build this right in. Now, cool. of course, this does require um, a flue, 
Mm -hmm. And it can be outfitted with gas logs, or you can burn mm -hmm. real logs in it, just as you could in the traditional fireplaces. Interesting. One of the things that happens with an insert fireplace is that you have the ability to recirculate the heat, so they're very fuel efficient. Very nice. Help out with all that glass, right? <laughs> Recycle a little bit <laughs> I think of that. They heat. would need that. Yeah. No, that's great. Very interesting. Well, you know, it's interesting. The first shots you showed us looked like mm -hmm. they were almost out of a palace and, and, and very palatial homes. This looks like it might be a little bit uh, less expensive. Could you talk to us a little bit about what, what someone should contemplate in terms of cost, high end, maybe middle and, and bottom end, and how that works out? Fireplaces certainly mm -hmm. range depending on mm -hmm. how ornate and uh, elaborate you want your fireplace to be. Size always has an impact on cost. But the traditional mm -hmm. fireplace uh, should be budgeted to cost somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, that would be the big, nice structural yeah, ones. That's the we big, look nice at. structure. Okay, and good. of course, if you want a hand-carved mantle mm -hmm. or you want to do some uh, very exotic stones and things, it might run a little more. Right. The insert fireplace, the metal fireplace, uh, those can be mm -hmm. bought for roughly five thousand dollars and put in place uh, for that price. Keeping it very simple mm -hmm. and straightforward, it, it is a very affordable approach. Well, that's excellent. Um, so basically anybody can play and, and everybody can make it work. Uh, is pr price is really not an object here. Um, talk to us a little bit about safety. You know, when you're talking about fireplaces, you're talking about an open <laughs> flame. And um, I always get a little skittish when the wife lights candles around the house. And, you know, you don't want to leave the house with a fire in the fireplace, even with a grill. Talk to us a little bit about how to own and operate a fireplace safely. Well, that, that is a very important point for our viewers to understand, mm -hmm. um, whenever you go about adding a fireplace to your home, you certainly right. want to work with a professional mm -hmm. who is knowledgeable of the local codes and, and have the house inspected while it's uh, having this addition made. Mm -hmm. um, so when it's built correctly, that's, that's a key ingredient. Right. And then, of course, the other thing that's important is that you have to maintain whatever you've added to your home, correct? Right. Like anything else. Like anything else. Right. So I advise our viewers to bring in a chimney sweep to clean the chimney once a year. So if there still are chimney sweeps? There are. There are folks that are specializing in that. Interesting. Certainly Interesting. creating mm -hmm. uh, protective guards over the top to keep the squirrels and the other animals right. from getting down into the chimney. But if you use your right. fireplace a lot mm -hmm. through the winter months, that's an important thing to do. Good. Uh, without doubt, if you are using gas uh, logs, you always want to have a plumber properly uh, install those gas logs, and you want this to be properly vented. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the important thing to, to continue to remember is that it's never perfect. You have to watch it, you have to take, protect it and take care of it, and at the end of the day, when you're finished with a fireplace, remember to close the flue. You don't want to lose a lot of that good heat. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, right along with that would be the consideration after safety is how do I, how do I make a selection that's fuel efficient? It's all about green. It's all about the saving energy cost. Talk to us a little bit about maybe some of the relative uh, pros and cons of some of, the, some of the approaches here. All right, well, I think all of us are much more <clears throat> conscious about that. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are certain cities in America where they're limiting the number of <clears throat> wood-burning fireplaces that you can have in the house because of air pollution. Right. But within our own homes, we're all interested in keeping our fuel bills uh, contained. <clears throat> and so I think one of the most efficient fireplaces that you can add, it's very affordable, mm -hmm. is basically what we would refer to as the old-fashioned potbelly stove. Let me nice. show you something that that I've actually used at my parents' home. Mm -hmm. uh, this Eden Air fireplace was installed in right. my parents' home and it reduced their heating bills by almost $100 per month. And they live in a 2,500 square foot house. Wow, huge. So that makes sense. Huge. And then the image at the bottom basically shows a much more contemporary version of what we would think of as a pot belly stove. Yeah, and this particular absolutely. version is one where at the end of the day you can close it off mm -hmm. and it still dissipates the heat mm -hmm. in the room and so it can actually keep your house or your cabin warm throughout the night. My caution here is to make sure you have guards up around it so that children don't fall into it. Excellent. Well, that, that's very good information. Um, and, and then just moving right along because I know we have a lot to cover here. <coughs> uh, what rooms can can a fireplace fit into? We all think of it going into the big great room and the big huge thing and just kind of briefly moving through these um, 
uh, where else can a fireplace fit and, and how easy and how hard is it to do that sort of thing? Well, I've already mentioned that I have several in my home and my, uh, my customers and my clients really love fireplaces and we're putting them in a number of places, including the bathroom. Wow. Nothing is better than getting in the, in the bathroom <laughs> and having a, uh, a fireplace there. Sometimes that's not so easy because it might be on an interior wall. So what the market has created for us are these alcohol-based fireplaces, oh, wow. such as this one. And it can be very, very small and fit in tight spaces, and yet you can still sit in the tub and enjoy the, the glow of the fire. So you keep that psychological impact mm -hmm. of a flame, and doesn't have to really be hot, doesn't yeah. have to stoke logs, but there's just something in us as humans. We like that fire there, don't we? We do. Make it feel warmer coming out of the restroom. And so we've talked a lot about inside the house. You know, one of the coolest applications, I think, for fireplaces are outside, open pit type things. Tell us a little bit about what's going on there. Well, let me begin by showing you a photograph of another client's project where we've created a very large fire pit. Wow. Um, and I must say that we're learning the trend is across America, people are investing in outdoor spaces. It is the fastest growing market for interior designers right now. Yeah. Oh, talk about a hospitality center. I mean, that's where you'd want to meet, right? Well, this is around a golf course, and so mm -hmm. they have a great view, and it is a, just a great meeting place, as it you said. It spans the whole livability of your house. It does. That's gorgeous. And then oh, I have else? another example, example here of uh, something that's much more portable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't have the option of building a permanent fire pit mm -hmm. or a fireplace oh, on the wow. exterior patio porch. And so you can go out and you can find these images of... of uh, basically bowls right. and this is a particular vertical container mm -hmm. that is easy to maintain and once it's uh, extinguished you can move it elsewhere so you could actually have it on the north side of your house if it was colder there and you wanted to keep it nice and warm. So it's actually portable I love that. Well Dan that's all fascinating. Um, I think that what we'd want to do now is just what kind of advice just fairly briefly uh, as, we, as, as we move along here what would you tell someone who says, boy, that's beautiful. How do I get started? Uh, what, what do you tell them? What do they need to know? Well, I think a fireplace most often is a permanent element to mm -hmm. the room. And so you certainly want to remember mm -hmm. to bring in a professional. Right. You know, you want to arrange the, the room with the furniture focused in right. the right direction. You want to remember that that fireplace will not be used in the summer months. And so what will right. that look like? Should you plan it around a window? Mm -hmm. Would you plan it around uh, having electric on the mantle so that you can use it at Christmas time? There's mm -hmm. a lot of things that need to be thought through. Good. So asking good questions and bringing in a professional is extremely Excellent. important. Dan, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a huge interest in what you've shared very briefly. How would people get hold of you? We've got about 30 seconds here. How would people get hold of you to contact you and follow up? All right, well, I would welcome calls. Uh, there's free consultation when anyone li would like to call my office, and I would like to um, encourage them to get in touch with us on our website at <clears throat> www.resortandretirement.com. Well, that wraps up our show for this week. Uh, I want to say thank you to Dane Cummings and Dan Lee for sharing some warm ideas with us. Join us next week for the next edition of Prime. I'm Bill Pemberton. See you next time.